parochial geopolitical needs. This has resulted in a shaking of global stability as well as the exacerbation and the fomenting of new hotbeds of tension. Risks of global conflict have heightened. In order to curb them, in order to bring things on a peaceful path, the Russian Federation has and continues to insist on all provisions of the United Nations Charter being respected and applied not selectively but fully in their full and interconnected way. This includes the principle of the sovereign equality of states, non-intervention in their domestic affairs, respect for territorial sovereignty uh, and territorial integrity and the right of peoples to self-determination, and the actions of the U.S. and their allies attest to the systematic violation of the balance of needs which have been enshrined in the Charter. Since the collapse of the USSR and the establishment of independent states in its place, the U.S. and its satellites have egregiously and openly interfered in the domestic affairs of Ukraine, as was publicly and even with pride recognized by the Deputy, uh, Secretary, uh, Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State Victoria Nuland in 2013. Uh, the $5 billion was spent on cultivating Ukrainian uh, politicians in Kiev by the West. All of the facts are being swept under the rug. Their attempts to cancel all of what happened since uh, prior to 2014. And for this reason, the theme of today's meeting proposed by the Albanian presidency is most apt, which allows us to restore the chronological succession of events, specifically in the context of relations of the main acting parties in the implementation of the principles and the purposes of the UN Charter. In 2004 to 2005, the West, with the aim of bringing to power pro-American candidate, sanctioned the first coup in Kiev, forcing the Constitutional Court of Ukraine to adopt an unlawful decision on the conduct of something which was unstated in the Constitution, namely a third round of elections. An even more uncere unceremonial intervention in domestic affairs was clear during the second Maidan in 2013 to 24. Then a litany of Western leaders directly encouraged participants, directly part uh, encouraged participants in anti-government demonstrations and acts of violence. The same Victoria Nuland discussed with the U.S. Ambassador in Kiev the composition of the future government to be comprised, composed of Putschist and the EU's real place in world policy. We all remember her obscene two words showing that the EU swallowed this. In February 2014, the U.S. selected individuals who became key participants in the brutal coup which was organized, I would recall, one day after what was reached under the guarantees of Germany, Poland, and France. I refer to the agreement between the legitimately elected president of Ukraine and the opposition leaders. The principle of non-intervention in domestic affairs was repeatedly trampled upon immediately after after the coup, the Putschists announced that their top priority was to, to deny the rights of Russian language speakers in Ukraine and the residents of Crimea and southeast of the country who refused to reconcile themselves to the outcomes of the coup were labeled terrorists. A punitive operation was unleashed against them. In response to this, Crimea and Donbass conducted referenda fully in line with the principles of equality and self-determination of peoples, which are enshrined in paragraph 2 of Article one of the UN Charter. Western diplomats and politicians vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine have been sh turning a blind eye to this important norm of international law. They have been trying to take all the background and the essence of what has happened and trying to distill this to the inadmissibility of violation of territorial integrity. Let us recall in this connection, a UN declaration was adopted unanimously in 1970. Uh, this is a declaration on the principle of international law pertaining to friendly relations and cooperation amongst the states in line with the Charter of the United Nations enshrines the following. The principle for the respect of territorial integrity is applicable, I quote, to states who, in their actions, comply with the principle of equality and self-determination of peoples and subsequently having governments which represent the entire entire people residing on the given territory. End of quote to the fact that the Ukrainian neo-Nazis who seized power in Kyiv did not represent the population of Crimea and Donbass is something which does not need to be proven. And the unconditional support from Western capitals of the actions, criminal actions of the Kyiv regime is nothing other than a violation of the principle of self-determination subsequent to an egregious violation in interference in domestic affairs. Uh, Parashenko and Zelensky, uh, 
adopted racist laws on the prohibition of everything Russian, education, media, culture, the destruction of books and monuments, the prohibition on the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, seizure of its property. These all became blatant violations of paragraph 3, article 1 of the UN Charter on the respect for human rights and basic freedoms for all, without distinction as to race, gender, language, and religion. Not to mention the fact that these actions directly ran counter to the Constitution of Ukraine itself, the Constitution which sets out the obligation of the state to respect the rights of Russian and other national minorities. When we hear calls for implementation of the peace formula to bring Ukraine back to the 1991 uh, borders, a question arises, uh, who is being called for this? Are those calling for this, are they familiar with the statements of Ukrainian leadership about what they intend to do with the residents of the relevant territories? And with respect to them, publicly, at the official level, repeatedly there have been threats voiced of, a, of their physical or legal annihilation. Incidentally, similarly, Western not only has not been uh, deterring its Western protégés in Kiev, but has enthusiastically been uh, encouraging this anti-Russian policy. Incidentally, similarly, members of the EU and NATO have for decades been encouraging the actions of Latvia and Estonia to strip the rights of hundreds of thousands of Russian language uh, residents who have been called non-citizens. Now there is a serious discussion for the introduction of criminal responsibility, criminal uh, liability for the use of their mother tongue. Ha senior officials officially state that the spread of information about the possibility of remote school programs, that this possibility needs to be considered as something almost a threat to national security, which requires the attention of law enforcement bodies. Turning back to Ukraine, in February 2015, the Minsk agreements were reached. And this included, a, a, this they, they were approved by a special security council resolution, fully in line with Article 36 of the Charter, which supports, I quote, any procedure for the, dis the resolution of disputes that was adopted by the parties. In this specific case, Kiev, Donetsk, and Lugansk. However, last year, all of the signatories of the Kin Minsk agreements, except for Mr. Uh, Putin, I refer to Merkel, Hollande, and Poroshenko publicly, and with some kind of pleasure even recognized that having signed this document, they had no intention of implementing it. They were simply looking to gain time to shore up the military capability of Ukraine and to funnel weapons into the country to be used against Russia. For all of these years, if the EU and NATO directly supported the sabotage of the Minsk agreements, encouraged the Kiev regime to use force to address the problems in Donbass, and this was all in breach of Article 25 of the Charter, according to which all members of the United Nations agreed to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council. Let us recall that the package with the Minsk agreements, the heads of Russia, Germany, France, and Ukraine signed a declaration where Berlin and Paris assumed an obligation to do a lot, including to help to restore the banking system in Donbass. But they didn't move a finger. They merely observed how, contrary to all of those obligations, Poroshenko announced to trade economic and transport blockade against Donbass. In that same declaration, Berlin and Paris, Paris assumed an obligation to comply with a trilateral uh, agreement in the EU-Russia-Ukraine format to practically resolve issues of concern to Russia in the area of trade, as well as to advance the establishment of a shared humanitarian economic space from Atlantic to the Pacific, I quote. This declaration was also endorsed by the Security Council and was also subject to implementation in line with Article 25. But this obligation also of the leaders of Germany and France was an empty promise and yet another violation of charter principles. Recently, the foreign minister of the Gromyko, the Soviet Union uh, prime minister, said better to have 10 years of negotiations uh, rather than a day of war. Following this, from, we have been engaged in painstaking negotiations, uh, reaching agreements on European security. We approved the founding Russia-NATO Act. We adopted at the highest level the OSCE Declaration on the Indivisibility of Security in 1999 and in 2010, and beginning with 20 
2015, we insisted on the unconditional implementation of the Minsk agreements, which emerged as a result of negotiations. And this is all fully in line with the Charter of the United Nations, which demands, I quote, to ensure conditions for the just and respect for obligations which emanate from treaties and other sources of international law, I quote. End of quote. And Western colleagues trampled upon this, prin these, this principle as well when they signed onto these documents knowing in advance that they had no intention would not comply with this. This has been repeatedly seen, and Mr. Putin referred to this repeatedly, including recently, and I'd like to remind the distinguished Secretary of State that President Zelensky signed a decree prohibiting the conduct of negotiations with the government of Putin. If the U.S. is so interested in them, I don't think it would be very difficult to give the command for the decree of Zelensky to be lifted. Now, in our Western opponents' rhetoric, we hear slogans, invasion, aggression, annexation, not a word about the root causes of the problems where they cultivated and encouraged openly Nazi regimes, which openly rewrote the uh, re outcomes of the Second World War and the history of their own people. A substantive negotiation based on facts and respect for all of the requirements of the UN Charter is something which the West has, uh, has avoided. And it seems uh, the, uh, that there is a fear of professional discussions that would reveal demagoguery uh, with incantations of territorial integrity. Former colonial powers uh, failed to mention the, uh, the need for Paris to return the so-called French Mayotte and the composition of the uh, islands for London to withdraw from the Chagos archipelago to begin discussions with Buenos Aires and the Malvinas Islands. These supporters of territorial champions of territorial integrity in Ukraine now make it appear as if they don't even remember the, the sense of the Minsk agreements, which lies, I recall, in the reunification of Donbass and Ukraine with a guarantee for respect for the fundamental human rights. First and foremost, the right to one's mother tongue. Having torn apart these agreements, the West now bears full responsibility for the collapse of Ukraine and for the fomenting of civil war there. Other principles in the Charter, respect for which could have prevented the security crisis in Europe and could help to reach a, a, an agreement on the basis of balance of interest, I would mention Article 2 of Article 8, which sets out the need to develop the practice of peaceful resolution of dispute with the assistance of regional organizations. In line with this principle, the Russian Federation, together with our allies, has been consistently advocating the restoration of contacts between the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the CSTO, and NATO to facilitate the practical implementation of the above-mentioned outcomes of the OSCE summit on the indivisibility of security, which stipulate, among other things, I quote, not a single state, group of states, or organization can be vested with the primary responsibility for the maintenance of peace and security and stability in the OSCE region or consider any part of that region as a sphere of influence, of its influence. It's clear to all that this is specifically what NATO was doing in its attempt to create a full uh, superiority and, uh, in, in Europe and now in the Asia Pacific. However, the repeated appeals of uh, uh, bodies of the CSTO to NATO were disregarded. The reason for such an arrogant position of the U.S. and their allies, as we see once again today, lies in an unwillingness to engage in any equitable dialogue with any party. If NATO had not rejected the proposal of the CSTO to cooperate, then perhaps we could have avoided numerous negative processes which resulted in the current European crisis because uh, Russia had been not listened to or deceived for decades. Today, at the proposal of the presidency, we are discussing effective multilateralism. Let us not forget the numerous facts of the genetic avoidance of the West of any forms of equitable cooperation. Consider Joseph Burrell's pearl that Europe is a flourishing garden surrounded by jungles. This is purely neo-colonialism with disregard for sovereign equality of states and the need to and a disregard for strengthening the principles of the UN through 
effective multilateralism. Trying to prevent democratization in international relations, the U.S. and its allies are openly and unceremoniously trying to privatize the Secretariat of, of the U.N. in circumvention of the Secretariat to trying to advance unconsensual mandates with claims to have the right to accuse those who, for one reason or another, are inconvenient to Washington. In this connection, let us recall the need for stringent compliance with the Charter, not just by member states, but also by the Secretariat of our organization. According to Article 100, the Secretariat has an obligation to act impartially and should not receive any instructions from any government. We have already talked about Article 2. And I wish to draw attention to a key point, uh, paragraph one, an organization based on the principles of sovereign equality of states. Building upon this principle, the General Assembly in the above mentioned 1970 declaration reaffirmed, I quote, the inalienable right of each state to select for itself the political, economic, social, and cultural system without intervention from any side. End of quote. And in this connection, we have serious questions that arise about the statements which our distinguished Secretary General delivered on the 29th of March that, and I quote, autocratic uh, uh, rule does not guarantee stability. This is a catalyst for chaos and conflict. And robust democratic uh, societies are capable of uh, correcting themselves, improving themselves. They can stimulate change, even radical change, without any bloodletting or violence. Violence. One cannot but recall the changes that were introduced by the aggressive misadventures of uh, robust democracies in Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and many others. The distinguished Secretary General then said they, democracies, are the centers of broad cooperation rooted in the principles of equality, participation, and solidarity. End of quote. Worthy of note is that this was all stated, this was all announced uh, by something Biden uh, convened beyond the frame, outside of the framework of the UN, the so-called Summit for Democracy. The US administration selected the participants of this on the principle of loyalty. Loyalty not so much for Washington, but rather the Democratic Party, which uh, rules in Washington, attempts to use a new formula uh, to address uh, issues directly contradict paragraph 4, Article 1 of the UN Charter, which sets out the need, I quote, to ensure the role of the organization as a center for agreeing on action for the achievement of shared goals. Contrary to this principle, many years ago, France, Germany, they proclaimed an alliance of multilateralists, where they also invited only those who were obedient. And this in and of itself once again points to the unshakable nature of the colonialist mentality and the view of the initiators of this meeting vis-a-vis -vis the principle of effective multilateralism. In parallel, there was a narrative that was imposed about the European Union as the ideal of multilateralism. Now there are calls from Brussels to expand the membership of the EU as soon as possible to include specifically the Balkan countries. But most important Importantly, it's not about Serbia, not about Turkey, where for decades hopeless talks have been carried out for their entry, but rather this is about Ukraine. Claim uh, Joseph Borrell recently uh, said that the key of regime needs to be uh, accepted into the EU as soon as possible. Apparently, had it not been for the war, this would have taken years, and now there's a need to do so without respect for any criteria. Serbia, Turkey, and others, they'll wait, but the Nazis it will can skip the queue to enter the ranks of the EU. Incidentally, at the same summit for democracy, the Secretary General uh, proclaimed that democracy emanates from the Charter of the United Nations. The first words of the Charter, we the people, reflects a fundamental source of legitimacy, the consent of the governed. End of quote. It is useful to compare this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this premise with the track record of the Kiev regime, who, beginning with the coup in 2014, and the war being unleashed against its own people, against the millions of people who did not consent to rule by neo-Nazis and Russophobes, thereby undermining the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Those who, contrary to the charter, divides humanity in democracies and autocracies, fail to respond to the question of what category they place the Ukrainian regime in.
I won't answer for, we wait for an answer. So there's a question about the, uh, uh, the relationship between the, Secretary, uh, the Security Council and the General Assembly. The Western aggressive clique has been peddling the theme of abuse of the right of the veto and uh, not with uh, an incorrect focus on other members of the UN. They have uh, reached the uh, result. This was resulted in the situation that after every exercise of the veto, veto, the General Assembly considers the matter. This is not a problem for us at all because the Russian approaches to all issues on the agenda are open. There is no, it, it is, does not pose a difficulty for us to expound on our positions or lay them out yet again. And the right to a veto is an absolutely legitimate instrument which is stipulated in the chart of the United Nations to prevent the adoption of decisions that would divide the organization. But if the procedure for discussion of the General Assembly of applications of the veto is a, uh, was approved, since this was approved, then why not consider why certain resolutions without any veto were that were adopted including those many years ago, but are not being implemented despite the provisions of Article 25 of the Charter. Why would the General Assembly not consider the reasons behind this? This includes resolutions of the Security Council of Palestine and a whole range of issues related to the Middle East, the JCPOA, Resolution 2202, which, was approved, which approved the Minsk agreements on Ukraine. Also worthy of attention is the problem linked to sanctions regime, regimes. This is now a norm. The Security Council after protracted negotiations, fully in line with the Charter, adopt sanctions against a specific country. Subsequently, the U.S. and its allies impose against that same state additional supplemental unilateral restrictions which did not secure the consent of the Security Council and are not included in its resolution as part of the agreed-upon package. This includes... Another very egregious example, Bar uh, Berlin, Paris, and London just adopted a decision through their national legislative bodies, for example, to extend something, re uh, restrictions against Iran that had were set to expire in October, uh, which are subject to a legal conclusion in line with Resolution 2231. So the Security Council uh, has determined that they have expired, but those countries decide that that they decide on the rules. After this, any adoption of a, of a council of, of sanctions, uh, uh, there, there is a need to consider the question of uh, the adoption of any sanctions by the Security Council not be overridden by the desires of others. Also important is for sanctions regime through the Security Council to be time-bound insofar as they're being unlimited in nature, deprives the Council of flexibility vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the impact on the sanctioned government's policy. There is a need to consider humanitarian limitations of sanctions. Uh, for sanctions projects introduced at the Security Council should be accompanied by assessments about their consequences through uh, consequences by humanitarian agencies of the UN, rather than being accompanied by demagogical exhortations of Western colleagues that simple that ordinary people will not suffer. The, we we see, an agree, uh, we see a deep crisis in international relations and the lack of willingness to redress this situation by the West. And the, the organization is responsible for the fate of uh, the world in the historic context. There's a need to abandon parochial, short-sighted arrangements and national elections of any given member state being taken into account. Let us once again recall, nearly 80 years ago, having signed on to the UN Charter, world leaders agreed to to respect the sovereign equality of all states, large states, small states, poor ones, rich ones, monarchies, republics. In other words, even then, humankind recognized the need for equitable, polycentric world order as a guarantee for the sustainability and security of its development. For this reason, we're not talking today about subordinating ourselves to some kind of a rules-based order, but we are talking about compliance with all of the obligations which we shouldered when signing the Charter in all of their integral and, integ and, and, and interconnected nature. Thank you. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Sergei Lavrov, and now I give the floor to Her Excellency, Mrs. Catherine Colonna, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Europe for the Republic of France. <laughs> 
microphone, please. I thank the Secretary General for his remarks. I wish to take this opportunity to begin by applauding the statement delivered by the President of Ukraine, Vladimir Volodymyr Zelensky. For the past 18 months, he has